Sunday. Can we do that? Can we do something a little different this Sunday? It's still going to be ministry. Miriam is not coming out this Sunday morning. Um, but as I was praying about to this morning and Sunday and our children being in service with us and uh, how could we have a moment today that was different but impactful and um, I was thinking about it and I was you know going through my process of Sunday morning and I was like the families are together our children are in service and I'm grateful now that I still have my parents but I'm also in the role of parenting and so I called Apostle, and uh, I love how he takes my, you know, sometimes he, you know, I'll give him an idea, and then he'll embellish it. Sometimes I'll give him an idea, and he may not fully see it, but then he'll, he gonna go, he gonna go with it, because he'll say, you the pastor. And um, it, it, I wanted to be here, because most of y'all know we go on vacation. I wanted to be here. I was like, no, let's do something together. And so... I want you all to help me welcome Apostle because this morning we're going to have a dialogue, an intimate conversation with you about how we've been made for family with our Apostle. Give our Apostle a big hand clap as he comes forward. We're going to put the apostle on the hot seat, not just for she Rose League, but we're going to put the apostle in the seat to get some instructions. Now, before you sit down, I am looking out, you know, in the virtual sanctuary, they're going to give you the right pictures, but I get to see how y'all look, and y'all look real snaggatooth and like we don't love each other. And this is your church family, and we love each other. So if you see some empty seats on your row or in front of you, can y'all move up? Ushers, can you help them do that? Um... Dry, I didn't get an apostle. We didn't get an apostle no theme music, huh? He ain't gonna. <laughs> but do y'all see why y'all are moving? Because none of y'all are moving, so I'm giving y'all time to help the pastor out. I need y'all to take notice of the apostles' like new footwear. And I would like to take credit that I did this, but it's my understanding this is the doing of Pastor P. But the kicks have been on point all week. What y'all say about it? Apostle is like, I may be 70, but I'm going to be fly at 70. And the footwear, we need a shoe cam just to show off the kicks this week. Okay, teens, I, I know y'all going to love Apostle, but I need the teens to make some noise. Can y'all check out the Apostles like? Pretty fly. Pretty fly. Come on. You may be seated now. You fly, you know. You know, he's sharp. See, here's what I love, Apostle, All while right. they're getting his, his, let's talk, talk, Apostle. I want to make sure we can hear Praise them. Praise the Lord, amen. <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> Is that your hallelujah this morning? Yeah. That's your, that's your hallelujah this morning. Yeah. You know, I just like, though, that you're not. See, most people think when you start getting older that you're supposed to embrace age and slow down and, you know. But you are like. I haven't got older yet. I haven't got older yet. I haven't got that. <laughs> I just wasted everything, though. It's okay. You still fly, and so am I. And it didn't get on us. Okay. The Louboutins are still Lord. good. We got a little sprinkle, yeah. but Sorry we got that. options. Amen. We got options. <laughs> so right. you come on, let me. I need to hear this. You're not getting old. No, I refuse that. I got too many scriptures in the Bible that tells me, that, you know, that uh, <clears throat> He restores my youth. So I'm not going, I'm not going, you know, you can say that when you, when you are, you know, when you're thirties and your forties and your fifties and a lot of folks start talking old. Death and life is the power of the tongue. Amen. 
And, um, you know, that's, that's just the way I see it. I, I ain't got no problem with y'all who want to get old and be old and talk old and talk, talk sickness and disease on your body, talk arthritis on your body, talk loss of memory on you. You're doing that. Some of y'all are doing that. Well, you know, when you get this age, Moses didn't get started till 80. Abraham didn't get the revelation until 75. And here you are, 60, and talking about, well, you know, oh, Arthur, really? <laughs> After sitting under this ministry all these years? And, and really, it ain't no rebuke, because I, 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 I have to get on my, some pastors in my organization. They call trying to be old. I say, go and be old if you want to. Amen, amen. Can we celebrate our pastor first of all? Was, was it masterful this week? And uh, I, I just want to let you know, if you have not seen uh, Friday night, you need to go back and look at, that should start our time now, should it? Yeah. Well, you're the well, you apostle. Well, you're the pastor, I'm sorry, if they want to start you're the time, you're the apostle, you the and I'm the pastor, yeah. so they can start the time, but yeah. we're going to do. Hey, whatever you want to do, but I'm just saying, uh, you know, you saw a masterful presentation of, of, uh, of the Word. That's the hardest way to teach when she taught in first person. That's hard. People stay away from that because they can't do it. She mastered it. To the glory of God. You ready to get into this dialogue? Yeah. You, you know, I, I know, I could, you know, like last week, you were masterful in your answers and the wisdom that comes from you, the wealth of wisdom is so amazing. Um, and so I, I want to talk this morning about relationships, friendship, family. And y'all, we're going to take full advantage of this moment. So even the children can participate in this. If you have a question that you would like to ask Apostle, you can, Apostle, myself, you can send it in. You can go to newlight.org slash ask Dr. I, A-S-K, Dr. I. And uh, while we're dialoguing this morning, I'm going to sprinkle some of those in. Let's go. You ready for it? All right, first question up that we're going to talk about. Um, and I think this is important because in the Bible, you can see how we're made to have family connections. From the beginning, Adam, Eve, you know, uh, you look through the Bible, two are better than one, that we're not supposed to do life just by ourselves, but we do life together. And so then there's this new group, there's a group of young people really that have an idea or this concept is being put out there that family is more than who is in your bloodline, but it's who you choose as family. And so how do you, uh, what is family to you? You know, I said during the conference, and when they asked me, how do you define manhood? I don't. I just go with the Word of God says. Yeah. And so, yes, family can be dynamic, but the Bible speaks to your biological family. But we know there are some people who don't know their biological family. So, you know, it is very, as I said, it is, it is dynamic. Yes, there can be others that you include in your family, but let's categorize them. I have an immediate family that Scripture speaks to. So that's how I define it. And there are very, like you have, we consider ourselves as a church family. That's another dynamic. You have your congenial family, which right. are like your friendships. Uh, and then you have covenant families, people who you're in covenant with. Correct. But you also have your natural biological family as right. well. Right. And so it's, and those are all throughout the word of God. I think even when you look at the disciples and Jesus, there was, there was mentoring, there was discipling, but they were always together. So there had to be times of family. Family, uh, they, they saw themselves as a family working together in some aspect. What are some essential things that should make up your family? Like, you know, um, I think a lot of times we can get in 
And as I'm a parent now, and I think about raising my kids, you can get into where family is just all instructional or very routine, but what are some necessary components that you should have in your family for a whole life family experience? Well, let's kind of, kind of back up just a bit. Sure. Because see, you have to decide <clears throat> what philosophy concerning life you are going to adhere to. You're going to live by some life philosophy. And the world is all, always coming up with new thoughts and new ways of doing things. But when we gave the, our lives to Jesus and made him Lord, we forfeited the right now to go another way. He's our Lord. We now have made the scripture, the word of God, the compass for our lives. So that is why I could care less what they say on television. I could care less what they, what they say is the new wave of thinking. I'm in the kingdom of God. And to a lot of the kids, that's what your parent is trying to, your parents, your godly parents are trying to say, oh yeah, all that out there sounds good, but none of it's proven. What has been proven is the truth of God's word. And that is why you have to say, the parent has to say, as for me and my house. We're going to follow the Word of God. That is the life philosophy that we have embraced. Now, once that's done, life becomes easy. Life becomes easy. Easy? Yes, it becomes easy. Why? I got the road map. I, I, got, I, got, the, I got the blueprint. And so, um, I had them... Can they put those on the screen? I had, the, I had the, the divine design for family. If they can put it on the screen, I think people will remember, remember those. Oh. They'll put them on the screen. Talk about what family is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Y'all got them on the screen. They got them on the center screen. They got them oh, on they're the going to put screen. them on one by okay. one on the side screen. All right. This is what family will do. Family should be a, 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 a crucible where there's the nurturing of basic emotional, spiritual, and physical needs. Mm -hmm. All right, family should exist for the protection during times of vulnerability. In other words, you gotta be there for each other when there is that need. You protect each other, all right? Then family has to be the place where there, there is forgiveness and restoration upon genuine repentance. Now, what does that mean? That has to do with, okay, none of us are perfect. Parents are not perfect. That's good. No, no, we're, we're, we're not perfect. I mean, by the time you learn to do it, they're grown. <laughs> right. By the, time you, by the time you really learn to parent, man, oh, they, okay. But we thank God for his grace. You know, our lives change when, when you know, Lady B and I, you know, we didn't do it right for a long time because we didn't know. But once we knew, I, you probably don't even remember the kids because y'all were sniggling. I came and apologized to you all. You probably won't never remember that. Do you remember that? I apologized to them for not having been the godly father I was supposed to be. I realized I had missed it. Uh, okay, okay, okay. That's okay. good. No, no, because I'm earnest in needing the grace of God to help me go further. I apologized to Lady B because of our, how I, I didn't know how to be a, 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 a good husband. I didn't know how to do that. In fact, all the, I was, I was, I was miseducated. I was miseducated. All the preachers I knew. Yeah, talk about that. No, all the preachers I knew, all the men, they were, they were domineering. You supposed to tell her, she, you say jump, she say how high. Now, y'all going to judge me, but that's, that's how I grew up. That's how a lot of your brothers around here, they grew up the same way. And in the back of their minds, you're supposed to do what I tell you to do. I'm the man. Y'all see my face? Well, if, 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 if you, if you uh, well, let me not say it that way. I'm, I'm, not, trying, I'm not trying to, I'm, not, I'm, try, I'm just, I'm trying to be transparent. Yeah. You got it? it? I grew up with preachers around pastors and preachers, and they were very domineering. They said, you make your wife. 
the opposite of talking. And you tell her what to do. And she, you know, all she, all she needs to do is sit down and shut up and be quiet. And that's what, I mean, so I'm, I'm, I'm in marriage like that. Now I have a problem. Because Bridget's saying, no. <laughs> she wrote, you ain't my daddy. Then I kind of, you better be glad I'm not your daddy. Just stupid. Didn't know what to do. I didn't understand. The Bible says when the Bible talk about submission, I don't know how. I know. I know how. I, nobody looked at it. It says submitting one to another. Yeah. So that means I'm not always right. I'm not always right. Now, as the head, I'm the example for doing it right. So, as the head, it doesn't mean I'm dominant, you don't know, that's not it. He says, I'm, God says, I've raised you up as my example. Okay? Now, I want y'all to hear this, too, because this is totally contrary to what a lot of stuff you hear. And it's, you know, you're supposed to be the priest of your house. That is nowhere in the Bible. That is nowhere in the Bible. Cool, talk about that. Because if, if, if I'm the priest of my house, and you're a single woman and you ain't, you ain't got no priest. <laughs> so where does that leave you? That's some stuff folks that start saying and people pick it up and then they make more of it than it is. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff we've been taught, we've got to, <laughs> we got to renew our minds. But I apologize to Bridget when I understood the way I was supposed to go and I focused on Building my, my house based on what the Word of God says, regardless of what was, you know, said about, you know, what others were saying in society. And, uh, you know, everybody says, she punking you out. No, she not. She ain't punking me. I can't say punk. Can I say punk? Yeah, she punking you out. No, I, and no, she ain't punking me out. She knows I am a man. I'm God's man. Yeah. You follow me? And so, that's, you know, you know I'll be talking too long. So, I, I kind of want to pause right here, and then we're going to come back. Some of y'all taking pictures of it. We'll put it back up uh, real quick. You can, oh, because I got off. I didn't finish all the rest of it. You didn't of finish them. It's okay. Finish, can I finish real quick? Sure. You support, encourage, and excel, and achieve. Yeah. So, the, the, yes, the family unit should be the place where everybody's pushing each other. All right, place where you can make a contribution in the lives of others, where we get together and we, we what can I do to help you with your dream? What can you do to help me? See, that is what makes the Hilliard clan what it is. Hilliard clan, you understand? Yeah, you know, because we push each other. We, what's important to you then becomes important to me. And then cultivate team agreement to attract the commanded blessings of the Lord. We understand how the devil wants to divide us and how the devil wants to keep us from that power of agreement by bringing in division and by bringing in envy. And, bring, and we said, we're not giving place to the devil. And so we have communications. Well, I'm, I'm selling, when something comes up, because we are all in flesh just like you. Yeah. The devil tries to attack us just like he attacks you. But we understand. We come together. We communicate. We resolve it. We find the fox. The Bible says the little fox is spoiled the vine. I, I would say we capture the fox. They say, no, we kill the fox. Amen. And then finally, it's a launching pad for divine destinies and generational assignments. I finished. Those are so good. I, I want to kind of go back to one of them and really like the protection during times of vulnerability. And I'm gonna tie two questions together because I think, and I say I think in this way, but I do realize now that I am even in this position as senior pastor, that how you parented me at 10, mm -hmm. how you probably parented me in my 20s, mm -hmm is how you parent me different. So how have you adjusted to the ages of parenting? <clears throat> I think you have to know your responsibility at, to parent at whatever level your child is. Parenting is a lifelong responsibility. I just want you to bring it to me in a bottle. Is that too, too raggedy to bring it to me in a bottle? You can have it. Yeah, because I'll be knocking another one over. Uh, yeah, so, and there are different levels. 
but, but did you hear the statement I made? The statement in parenting is a lifelong responsibility. And uh, when our children leave home, thank you so much, when our children leave home and uh, start their own families, our love for them don't cease. Our concern for them, for them don't cease. It is a lifelong responsibility. Now, I got to be sensitive to the culture. I've got to be sensitive to that individual child. One child may need more than another. I understand that. And by the grace of God, I'm going to be able to handle that child at that infant stage where they really need all the care and everything because in emphasis, they can't do nothing for themselves. And uh, I don't want to get into that. But anyway, you know, I, have, I can't say that. No, I'm going to say it. Uh, and so then that's the childhood. Childhood is there, it's, it's training, you know, and that training is having to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And then that's the adolescent. When they get to adolescent, they challenge everything you've trained them. It is a part of uh, that independent nature that God wants us to have, but the devil will, he will pervert it. And he will cause them uh, not only to challenge their training, but challenge a relationship with God. That is why our ministry to them is so important because we cannot afford to allow the world's voice to be the only voice that they hear. So it does not require a lot of hollering and, and, and scolding, but a lot of really what I think is, is really communication uh, to, um, um, uh, to communicate this is why we do what we do. Yeah, you're going to be exposed to a whole. Now, here's what our, our, my our old school parents would, to, would say. You know, say, well, so-and-so mama do this. She said, I'm not so-and-so mama. <laughs> right. Well, she said, quick, this ain't the house. They, they don't live in this house. And so then there's the adult phase. Now, in, in adults, then you have to give wisdom upon request. Wisdom, guidance upon request. You can't go and run their house. And that's where, uh, you know, the whole lot of folk mess up because you're trying, to, you're trying to be, you're trying to have them in an adolescent and a childhood, and they're grown. They're grown. I mean, Terry and them live right across the street from here. You too. How many times have, you, have I actually been in your house? You can probably count it on one hand. Yeah, I don't think you've Terry been in Tina? my house this year at all. Why? Why? I, I see, and that's contrary to what a whole lot of people think. A whole lot of people think I run them. I don't run them. I, don't, I mean, I ain't got time for them. I got too much other stuff I want to do myself. And they run their own lives. You got it? And, I, you know, they do things I don't like. <laughs> no, I didn't. You know, if it's, if it's something unrighteous and devastating, I'm going to speak up. They're still my kids. Are you listening to me? And so, um, um, yeah, so at those various levels, you know, uh, you've got to be sensitive to the culture. You've got to be sens sensitive really to that person's own conditioning, how God, has, how God is using them. And you've got to, the key would be to communicate. Yeah. Um, okay, so one of the things, I'm at, this, is, this is a two-part question. Well, let me go to this, is a lot of people have blended families. You know, your, your mic is picking up your, your fans, so if they hear it. My mic is picking up my fan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you have a lot of blended families. Okay. How do you handle when the step family members, this is a question from the audience and I'm glad we can, I want you to know that I don't see your names when you send it in. So how do you handle when a step family member doesn't want to be family with you in the blended family? So there's a blended family and now they don't want to be blended with you. Well, you cannot, you can only control the things you can control. All right, you have to first choose not to be offended. Because once you get offended, all right, then you polarize yourself. If the person chooses not to be blended with you, 
there's nothing you can do but love them and not let their reaction or their inaction rob you of your peace. I'm going to love you whether you love me or not. I'm going to be kind to you. You follow me? I'm not going to accept abuse. But at the same time, it's, the Bible says, let not your heart be troubled. Some things you got to put in the Lord's hands and let him work them out and be okay with it. Because I can't control it. I can't make you love me. I can't make you like me. I can't make you want to be my brother, want to be my sister. If there's some issues you're dealing with, I'm going to let that be your issue. But as far as me, I'm going to be consistent because at such time you choose to change, I'm ready. Can we have a transparent moment? Sure. Um, Y'all know Tina didn't live with us until she was 18, right? 18. So, and at that time, we didn't have enough bedrooms. Tina, remember this? We didn't have enough bedrooms in the house for Tina to have her own bedroom. You remember this, Dad? I don't remember none of that. <laughs> so Tina and I shared a bedroom. And although we had prayed as kids for Tina to come and stay with us, and you know, it was a part we never forgot her, I had one day because I was used to having my own bedroom. Because about 12, 13, something was happening on the inside. <laughs> something was happening with me on thir at 13. So I think y'all had went to the mall one day, and Tina got back, and I put, you remember this now? <laughs> I put all the, <laughs> I put all of Tina's clothes and everything in the hallway. I remember that. So I decided in the room that I was allowed to have, that I was gonna kick Tina out my room because they had made me mad. And they had come home because I was, I was having one of my teenage attitudes and they left me to go to the mall and I was like, I'm gonna fix y'all when y'all get back. Everything was in the hallway. How do you parent, I get it as an adult, but what does the parent do now? And it's almost bringing in that sibling rivalry too when your children are not accepting the blended family. And that's why they need to, they need to be at my seminar, virtual seminar. <laughs> they do need to be on your virtual <laughs> seminar. What to do with this child. <laughs> I turned out all right though. But we yeah. had to buckle up and ride it out for a good Well, that's part of years. it. See, see that's a, most people don't stand. See, that's a part of it. And when you, when you think that that's not a part of it, that's when it becomes a big problem. It's a part of it. When you see, you know, the little sibling rivalries all throughout the Bible, it's in life. Then what you have to do is we set up guidelines. We made corrections where corrections needed to be made. And uh, they grow to love each other. They, praise the Lord, they did. Um, but, 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 but really, the person who would need to answer that would be Lady B. Mother, do you feel like answering that? This is, y'all are just in our conversation. And is this helping? Listen, and you got everybody's attention. Everybody knows that they want to know what happened. But I do remember that. I didn't we, get no gentle parenting. <laughs> <laughs> so I do remember the situation. I remember what happened uh, was that um, I think Dr. I was reprimanded and we told them that they were still, they were sisters, they had to love each other, that there's no competition, no jealousy, you know, and I think Dr. I's punishment was she had to sleep on the sofa for a couple I of- I did. Yeah. I put out my room and Tina moved back in my room. <laughs> right. So, um, I think during that time is that the parents have to um, be more conscious of um, 
making sure that the children are loving one another, disciplined, not, not the parents taking sides one to another, but doing those things that could correct and make sure that they're doing right. And I believe as long as it's not a toxic situation, you have to uh, basically do what you can do to make sure that everybody stays on one accord. So um, we punished you, um, we pun uh, and then we made you guys, I think you, all, you had to write a letter of apology to team uh, and uh, you had to uh, tell her that you loved you loved her. So it was a process, but I don't know how long you guys stayed in the same room together. I think maybe a couple of months. Until we moved. Yeah, well, we moved like a couple of months after she <laughs> moved in with us. So, but uh, uh, you know, that was very good, mother. Thank you. you um, there was no gentle parenting. Now, what is this gentle parenting? Oh, I don't understand see, that. I know these new words, you don't, yeah, you know, right. when we was talking about vulnerability the other day yeah, uh -huh. and soft life, you was like, so there's this new thing called gentle parenting. Okay. Uh, it has, it, it totally does not line up with spare the rod, spo spoil a child. Okay, it okay. is really, you parent from a gentle space. Oh. So it's no, there's no quote unquote, whoopings, disciplinary action. I'm gonna coach you through your emotions. I'm gonna coach you through your feelings. While you sit there, I want you to think about what you've done or I'm not gonna raise my voice at you. Oh. I'm going to be constantly aware that you are a free will individual. Somebody got their whistle from She Rose Lee. <laughs> uh, I'm conscious that you are a free will individual that has the ability to make decisions. So while you are in your moment, pause and think about what has happened so that you can make a better decision okay okay gentle, on your own okay gentle, very good gentle. gentle parenting is no parenting because that's not training the bible says you train up a child in the way he should go now that new style, I've heard, you know, because I do a lot of research, and that new, a new approach has to do with they are, they are becoming who they want to become. No, 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 we don't become who we want to become. We become who God made us. Got it? And so, <clears throat> and, and uh, uh, so I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't agree with that. And the Bible says children are arrows in our hands. We have to give that arrow direction. And to say, okay, Arrow, go where you want to go, that's stupid. And, and I think we've got to be clear, you can parent and train and not be abusive. Correct. We're not and talking about And the scripture about is not saying with the spare the rod, spoil the child, for you to be an abuser. But it also does not mean that you negate your responsibility of training and directing your children in the way they should go. Right. I just, I want to put that out there. Uh, you, you, you told me something. Y'all are coming in with these questions so hot. So we're going to take part of the 10 minutes and then we're going to shift to what we were, we were talking about on, um, on our call yesterday when I told you I wanted to do this. Um, you told me something when I was raising Ivan. Ivan, people probably don't realize that Ivan probably at the age of three would turn around in restaurants and talk to people when we had strategies conference and they would go and do the tours of the daycare, Ivan at maybe three would stand outside of the door of his class and introduce himself. Hello, I'm Ivan Hilliard. I'm Bishop Hilliard's grandson. Would you like for me to show you around? He was always very aware of who he was. Conversating with people was not um, something that he avoided. He made sure that even at a young age, he would talk to people. His, 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 um, his ability to try and, and push the envelope was always there. And got that, I was- Got that from his mom. <laughs> so one thing you said to me one time, cause I was like, what am I gonna do with him? You were like, you said, instruct him and discipline him, but don't break his spirit. Correct. For that parent that 
right now, what your child is doing may be a distraction in this season of his life, his or her season, but it's something that is beneficial to their potential and where they're going. How, as a parent, do you parent them without breaking the spirit? Because what does that mean of, I, I'm trying to get him to understand order and structure, but I also know that's a part of his, de his makeup to do something in the earth. How do I parent that child and not break their spirit? May 18th at 7 p.m. What to do with this child? I couldn't resist that. You could. <clears throat> No, um, what you have to do is understand you've been blessed with a strong-willed child, which means that, that, that child has great potential for great accomplishments. So what you do is you set up guidelines and have them respect God. You can, cre keep, you can have your creativity within these guidelines. When you see that they have a particular pursuit then that is where you want to be able to push them. But the guidelines is the key. You set up guidelines. These are things that, we, that are acceptable. These are the things that are not acceptable. And you have to reinforce those guidelines. I'm giving you space to be creati creative. I'm giving you space to do some of the things, but here are the parameters. Well, why I have to do that? Because I am the parent, and that is my responsibility. You don't see me as protecting you now, but you'll appreciate me later. That's good. Okay, one more question from, I'm gonna do a couple questions. So gonna Are y'all enjoying this? Okay. How do you deal, there are a couple questions about in-laws. Like one question says, how do you do, deal with in-laws that you don't care, that, that you don't care about because, oh, how do you deal with in-laws? I was gonna say that they don't care about you, but how do you deal with in-laws that you don't care about because of betrayal? And then another one says, when my mother-in-law and my father-in-law have family gatherings and they invite the ex-spouse over because they still have a good relationship, it makes me uncomfortable and I don't like going around it, so I choose not to attend. How do you handle the in-laws and the extended families? Okay, now, I got experience at that. My mother did not want me to marry Bridget. She wanted me to marry Bridget. Did everything she could to talk me out of it. Then later in, uh, after, later, you know, Bridget's parents were, were uh, you know, they weren't jumping up and down by her marrying me, but you know, they, wouldn't, they didn't fight it like my mother fought. My mother fought it. Yo, I don't like her, my mother. That's my mother, you know, she's telling me <clears throat> um, and so later on when we had our little marital problems then of course I would tell my mom all the bad things about Bridge. she'd go tell her parents all the bad things about me so her parents wanted her to get a divorce leave him you do bad all yes okay so now when we had our moment of, of, uh, of our G come to Jesus moment where we're going to live together, we're going to make this marriage work in Jesus' name. We know how, but we're going to do it. You got it? Now, we had polarized our families. And whose fault was it? It was our fault. I didn't want to go around them people. She didn't want to go around my people. So we, made a, we, we, we came into an agreement when they have family things, it's okay for you to take the kids to the family event. I'm not going, Bridget say, because I'm, I'm, I don't feel comfortable. And I, I can understand that, because everybody whispering and, you know, she didn't want to be subject to that. And the same thing. I don't want to go see her family. Her, I don't want to go around her family. She'd take the kids there. And when we sat down, we messed it up. We're going to pray it back together. So we committed the whole thing to prayer. You follow me? Now, we were never disrespectful because we've been taught never be disrespectful. So we were always respectful when we were putting those situations where we were around them. Well, I was never, I didn't know, no, no. We didn't have that attitude, that sort of thing. So in time, 
God worked it all out. When we built one of our houses, we built a room for my mother. And during the latter days of my mother's life, Bridget took care of my mother. We moved Bridget's mother and father out of the ghetto and bought them a house. And, uh, you know, uh, Brother Harrison uh, and I, you know, we, well, Bridge mom, you know, she eventually fell in love with me. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. And we all, you know, but we had to give things time. When you choose not to be offended, you open the door now for the grace of God to go to work. We are kingdom people. And being a kingdom person, we got to trust God to do what we cannot do. Do for, do, 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 do for us for things we can't do. I can't change people. I can love people. And the power of love is amazing. That's so good. The power of love is amazing. I've got three quick questions that I just got to get in. And one is for our singles. I see a couple single questions like the dating scene is, I know what y'all say. Um, but this said the dating scene is scary. One person is talking about like, I'm single, I'm young, and I'm trying to live for God. What are some disciplines that I can have? What is some advice that you would give young singles in looking for a mate and maintaining their Christian walk? That's an answer for the pastor. That's a question for the pastor. Sure. Um, I, I, think, I think you have to be cautious, especially if you're a single parent, who you bring in your children's life. And stop looking for a spouse to be the answer for you raising your child. You are complete in him. I think that has to be the anchor for even just you as an individual. Instead of trying to be so concerned about finding somebody to complete you, is understanding that as a single, you are complete whole. And mm -hmm. when he or she comes along, it is two whole individuals coming together as one and not two halves making one. So I, one of the major things as a single person is that you have to stay focused. You have to decide that you're going to discover who you are in Christ Jesus so that when it comes to finding or being found, you can spot a joker as soon as he show up. You know, one of the questions was being unequally yoked. And we think that just because they're saved, that means you're equally mm. yoked. And no, that no. is not what that means. The yoke refers to how they used to make sure oxen would go in the right direction. Are you going in the right direction? Don't get mesmerized because you see them at church, you see them cleaned up, and you see them, they, <laughs> they can do all the Christian talk. They're going go to go come to church with you. And then you get married and you realize he don't love God. He don't like to, he don't like to go to church and he just used that to get to you and vice versa and so the equally yoke is not making sure they oh he saved oh he he served as an usher what where is he going what direction is he going in what's his heart those are things that you have to look at but I would say and then serve the time of your singleness is the time that you ought to be busy serving and when you seek first the kingdom of God he'll add everything that you need to your you got life. to believe it though and you got to believe. See, you got to believe. All you're saying is true, but a person has, has to reach a point where they really believe it and trust it. Yeah. And, 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 and God will open your eyes. And listen, you say, well, I don't know. Well, you, you, you need to be around wise people who can see what you don't see and trust, you know, and, and, and trust their input. Yeah. Now... Um, you know, I'm going to go back and then I'm coming right back because I think you can't change because part of the question was the in-laws are inviting the ex-spouse to the house. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can change that because that's not your house. Correct. But you can govern yourself accordingly on how you're going, what rooms and positions you're going to be in. Because especially if the ex-spouse is a and you're co-parenting, then there's the ex-spouse has the potential to show up in different settings, and you've got to be clear and know who you are and, and be 
and you and the spouse have to have clear communication, the ex-spouse have clear communication, well, your current spouse, because you're saying the ex-spouse comes over. There has to be communication with the, the current spouse of what you need, how you want to be handled, and how you're going to handle the co-parenting space. But you cannot tell your in-laws that they can invite the ex-spouse over, especially if their children involved. Right. I agree. All right. Um, I want to go back to this one, and then we're going to talk about what we talked about um, because I want to bring clarity to it because somebody put it out there, and uh, it's all it always comes up. You know, you said that you talked about the priest of the home. So, you know, a lot of times people try to bring up uh, if the husband is the head of the wife, you know, the man is the head of the woman, that scripture. And then they try to bring it into the church setting. Give, give just some a quick clarity because really in the kingdom of God, there's neither male nor female. And that's, that's the bottom line to it. And so the home order and the church order and the hierarchy in church has nothing to do with female or male in a body of leadership. But I want you to answer it since you made the statement of the priest in the home. Well, you already answered it. The well, word is the final. Yeah. Either, either there's, the scripture says, in the kingdom, there's neither male nor female. That's the kingdom order. Home order, the Bible says, when there's a man in the house, he's the head. That's clear. But now when we look over in the kingdom of God, do we see female leadership? Yes, we do. You can't deny that. But now if you want to be stuck in your tradition and let your tradition make the word of God none effect, then you're going to miss it. Because you're going to say, oh, no, ain't no, that she ain't, ain't no I'm supposed to be leading no man. Well, you didn't leave Houston when the male was a full female. You didn't leave Houston. When we had the, when we had the, when we had the females as, a, as the male, you didn't leave. Oh, and when you got a female supervisor, you don't quit. Quit being a hypocrite. Talk, sir. Amen. Well, you know, we were talking about parenting, and you've got the upcoming seminar, What to Do with This Child. And as, as we really get into this, how important children are to the kingdom of God, I want to throw out one question. What's the lesson that you want your children to walk away with? The lesson that I want your children to walk away with my children. Which yeah. what set of children? Like I got spiritual children. I got biological let's, children. Let's do biological children. What's what's the if you would say this is the one lesson that I want you to hold on to? What lesson would be that? Oh my God, that's easy. I know you got a lot of them. But no, 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 that's easy. That's easy. That's not that's not difficult at all. I'm I'm working on um, I'm working on something now. Um, I was talk, talking to you about because children's ministry is, has always been close to our hearts. Always close to our hearts. And so I'm gonna be talking to my pastors on Tuesday. Have a couple hundred pastors I talk to once a month. We call it our power talk. And uh, what God told me to talk to them about is this passage that's in uh, Matthew, I told him to put it on screen, um, Mark, it's in Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, Look at this. They'll put that on the screen real quickly. And they kept bringing young children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples were reproving them for it. But when Jesus saw it, uh, he was indignant and pained and said to them, allow the children to come to me. Do not forbid or prevent or hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive and accept and welcome the kingdom of God like a little child does positively shall not enter it at all. And he took them, the children, up one by one in his arms and fervently invoked a blessing, placing his hands upon them. Wow. Now watch this. So I'm, I'm going to be, I'm working on this. Everybody say he's still working on it. <laughs> but right there is the essence of how God wants every church, 
every person, every pastor to look at children. First of all, the parents were bringing them. They were bringing them, and the disciples were telling them, we don't have time for children. We don't have time for them. But the first point, if y'all taking notes, he saw them. Everybody shout, he saw them. He saw them. Oh, no. he saw them. He saw them. Oh my God, can y'all say it loud enough? He saw them. He saw them. Okay, he saw them. So that means God sees you. He sees every hurting parent. And people don't understand there are a lot of hurting parents because of uh, the waywardness of their children. There are a lot of hurting parents. But parents today, I want you to know he's looking at you. He sees you. Secondly, watch this, he saw the children. So God's got his eyes on every one of your children. Thirdly, watch this, he saw the disciples and he saw that they had lost his vision for children. All right, not only, all right, number one then, what did he do? He, uh, he saw it. Then number two, he spoke up for them. He spoke up for them. There has to be somebody who will speak up for children. Amen. So he spoke up for, he spoke up for them. He spoke up for the parents because the parents were saying, we need Jesus to touch our children. And the disciple says, he ain't got time. And then he, he watch this, he applauded the parents, but also what he did was he uh, admonished the disciples. He was telling them, no, y'all doing this wrong. And every church that avoids its children's ministry is doing it wrong. All right, watch this. He took them. Everybody say he took them. Ooh, watch this. Now, when he takes them, that means he's saying, I got time for y'all. I know there's a multitude wanting me to lay hands on them. I know there's Pharisees and Sadducees that want me to argue with them. But wait a minute. I got time for the children. <laughs> Ain't nobody happy with me, Reed. All right, watch this. And I like what it says there. He took them, watch this. He took them one by one. Oh, you missed it. He, he didn't do this group thing like you don't matter. But he did an individual thing. So you, not, you need to understand your child matters to Jesus. Watch this. Then the scripture says, he touched them. He laid his hands on them. Now, there's a power in the laying on of hands, much more than the, the laying on of hands for the healing of the sick. But there's an impartation that occurs when hands are a dynamic, everybody say dynamic impartation. That impartation, when I lay hands, is, a, is allowing the, the transference of the Holy Spirit to go to work in the life of a person. And thank God this church has not gotten away from the laying on of hands. Amen, amen. And then he blessed them. Everybody say he blessed them. Now he blessed them by speaking over them. What are you speaking over your child? What are you speaking over them? N not, not when they're doing everything right, but when you're tempted to say, you just like your no good daddy. No, no, your mouth over your child, prophesy over them. Declare what God says over them. Jesus intentionally invoked a blessing on them. And y'all know sometimes you better be intentional. And then finally, he discipled them. He used this as a teaching moment. Everybody said a teaching moment. And the Bible says, he said, now listen, the whole kingdom of God functions like a child, that I've got to be at the point where I really understand I just got to put my trust in him. I got to humble myself as a child and watch God work, protect, and provide for me. People wondered. I was talking to Compassion International the other day. It's a big group that want to partner with us at Love City. In fact, they're partnering with us this year. When I say partner, that means they, they're going to provide resources. That's it. And so they asked me, why 
are you so passionate about children? I told him, I said, this is not something just, that just came about. Put the little raggedy building up there. Y'all knew I was going to do that, didn't you? Y'all knew I was going to do that. Put the little raggedy building up there. In the little raggedy building, what most people don't understand, Lady B and I, we had a children's ministry. We had a bus ministry. Now, let's take a bus ministry. Bus ministry is, going, going, is, is out, out of date now. But on Saturdays, we were out every Saturday morning knocking on doors, asking parents, let us have your children in the morning for Sunday school. Every Saturday, our Saturdays were not spent at the mall. We didn't have no money anyway. Our Saturdays, <laughs> our Saturdays were us knocking on doors. We we're in the projects, knocking on doors, asking the parent, would you let me have your child in the morning? I'm going to take good care of them. I'm going to take them to Sunday school. I'm going to bring them back to you. And we would, then on, month, on Sunday morning, we up early. Why? I'm the bus driver. I don't have staff, I'm the bus driver. And I'm driving the bus, and Lady B got the donuts. We had donuts and all that sort of thing, and she passing out the donuts as they get on the bus. We come on the, where well, my church at, put my church. Oh, they got the bus. I didn't know they had the bus. Oh my God, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, and so, and so, and so listen, um, uh, we get there. I, I'm also the superintendent of the Sunday school. So I'm opening the Sunday school, watch this, and then after, and now I'm the teacher also. So I'm teaching the children, you understand? Lady B is, you know, she helping them, and we, got, we got a few workers helping them. Then after that, you know, I'm the pastor. So I got to preach the sermon on Sunday, you understand? Then after that, what? I'm the bus driver. I got to get back on the bus, and I got to take them back to their houses. We demonstrated that. And so the paper, people say, ain't nobody over there but a bunch of children. They called, they called my church Kitty Land. They don't understand I was getting those kids saved and, and showing them how to go back home and win your mama and win your daddy. I love kids. And the reason I love them is somebody took out time with me. Y'all remember her name? Miss Rachel, for some of y'all who don't know, I'm about eight, nine years old in Miss Rachel's house. During the summer, she would have, where are my kids? 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 All my kids, stand up. All my kids, stand up. Stand up. All my kids. Wherever you are, children, teenagers, all y'all, y'all stand up, 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 stand up. Stand up, wave at pastor, wave at me, wave at apostle, wave at us. All right, watch this. All right, watch this, watch this, watch this, okay. Y'all can remain, y'all can sit down, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Let me tell you something, let me tell you something, tell you something. So Miss Rachel had this room wallpapered with pictures of the Bible. And you could point out a picture and uh, she would tell you that Bible story. How she got us there in the, you know, in the hood, she, she had, um, you know, she in the neighborhood, she had cookies and Kool-Aid in the summer, and that was free, that was free snacks, you understand? She let us know, everybody know, and all the kids would come to Miss Rachel's house. We sit on the floor in, in that room, all of us sitting on the floor, and she's, she'd give somebody opportunity to point out a picture, and she'd tell that whole Bible story, and she would bring it, I don't know how she would do it, whatever picture you pointed to, She'd bring it back to Jesus on the cross. And one day in Miss Rachel's house, she asked the question, would anybody like to give their hearts to Jesus today? After telling us how he died on the cross, after telling us how he sacrificed, and my little hand went up. And when that happened, what Miss Rachel would do, she let everybody else who just came for the cookies Everybody else who just came for the punch, she let them lead the room. Here I am, one-on-one -on -one with Miss Rachel, and she led me to Jesus. Changed my life because she cared. She put me in a position to hear the voice of God. And a year or so later, I heard God call me into the ministry. And I have been walking with him 60 years. And I haven't missed a thing. 
I want my kids to understand this. Because they're going to tell you that your life in Christ is not going to be productive. I'm a living witness. If you obey and serve him, you spend your days in prosperity and your years in pleasure. Don't let nobody lie to you. Our God is real. Pastor, 